Up next, a look at an escape room in a box game. Exit the game, the secret lab. All right, escape rooms are becoming more and more of a big deal around the world. Uh, along with that popularity has come a wide variety of tabletop escape room games. Uh, basically, an escape room you can play at home. Now, today I'm going to look at one of these escape room board games, Exit the Game, The Secret Lab. Now, this is actually my first time playing any of these board room escape room games. Now, uh, I don't think there's any spoilers here. The only thing I'm going to spoil in this is I'm going to give you the setup, which is the first thing you read in the rule book. So I'm not spoiling any of the actual puzzles. So now this is an interesting concept for me because I feel like the immersion is part of what makes uh, the escape room special. And yeah. this game relies on a smart little cardboard box of puzzles to do that. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, exit the the Secret Lab. I think all the Exit games, so I could be wrong about that. At least this one was designed by Inca and Marcus Brand. Features art by Inca Brand, Marcus Brand, Sylvia Chinstoff. I apologize for my pronunciations. And Franz Volwinkel. Isn't was that produced Christoph? In... Christoph, yes, it would be. Sylvia Christoph, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was published in 2016 by Cosmos Games or Thames and Cosmos. Now, opening up the Secret Lab, like Sean said, it's a small box really small uh there's a short rule book another rule book that the first rule book warns you not to look at um two thin cardboard punch boards like really thin and two stacks of cards which also had big warnings on you telling them not to look at them or touch them uh the final con component in the box is one of those clue wheels that man i'm totally 80s zork flashback there that i figured i was wasn't sure if i had an anti-piracy thing or a puzzle piece uh, the Great Secret Code Wheel, a fun puzzle stable since the secret code rings ordered by mailing in the bottoms of cereal boxes. Yes. Now, these games uh, are tiny. They're not that expensive. And the components were pretty much what I expected. Uh, the game's pretty much made up of cards, though interesting isn't a card game at all. You're not playing cards. You never shuffle. You never draw a hand or anything like that. Uh, the cardboard punch out's rather thin, but you know what? It worked for what it was, and I'm not going to tell you what it was. Uh, the cards are very good quality. Like, these are nice, solid cards. Uh, I think there's a linen finish on them. Artwork was fine. I, it was good. It, it fit the theme. The instructions are 99% clear, almost perfect. The only thing that I did find missing was that nowhere did it tell you to punch out the punch boards, like the, the punch board that comes with it. Now, I admit, it's pretty obvious. You got a punch board, you punch it. But just with how literal the game is about everything else, because it is a puzzle, I did think it was odd that it was omitted from the rulebook that said, hey, before you start, punch out the punch boards. And to be fair to the game, this game is very inexpensive. So quality components are going to be limited. It's kind of impressive they got what they did. Yeah. Now, the instructions are written so you read them as you play the game for the first time. So there's no prep here. You sit down, open the box, and read it. Um, starts off with setup. The setup in this is you apply for a job at a lab, you're answering a thing in a paper, and once you get there to test some drugs, you wake up, you're drugged, there's like a, a, a test tube starts bubbling stuff, and you pass out, you wake up in a locked room. You have to solve a series of rizzles in order to get out. Note, there's no actual lock here, and there's no actual time limit except for end scoring, so it's not quite the same thing of being locked in a physical room. Now, getting the game ready to play is very simple. You take the two sets of cards and you split them into a bunch of decks. There's two main decks. One's riddles, which are sorted alphabetically, A through whatever. And then the answer cards, which are sorted numerically, one through whatever. Now, there's also another number of clue decks. And in this case, there's 10 of them. And those are sorted by symbol. Each of these clue decks has three cards in them except one. The game also came with what they called tools. These are things that were on the punch boards, and there have to be two of them in this game. And you're told to leave those in the box until you're told to get them out. Now, there's also this pamphlet that you get access to right from the start. The last thing, then, is the code wheel that you just keep on hand that you use whenever you think you've solved one of the riddles. Now, you mentioned first time, but this is a one-and-done game, which yeah. is part of the reason for its low cost. It's not designed to be replayable. No, not at all. And you know what? I'm going to re address that at the end of the review. I want yeah. to talk specifically about the replayability of this and the claim that it can be replayable. I just want to, I, I dropped that in there. I, I know we're going to talk yeah. about it later, but because you did talk about playing it the first time, I wanted yeah. to sort of slip so there that in is there. is only a first time. We yeah. played it. Um, now, the pamphlet very clearly leads you to the first clue. Pretty much. Um, 
your first riddle, whenever you get a riddle, whenever you get a clue, you're going to flip over the appropriate riddle card and do what it says. This should lead you to a three-digit number by solving the card. If you can't figure out how to get this number, you can then draw from those clue decks. Now, I mentioned the clue decks are three cards. Well, the first one just tells you what you would have had to unlock and have found to solve it. So it's just, do you have everything available to even solve this yet? Because there's some of the riddles that can't be solved until you solve other ones, right? Like a big chain. Uh, the next clue is going to give you a hint. The third clue gives you the solution and how you should have gotten to the solution. So this is very much for those of you who may not have had the chance, like a real escape room, but without the underpaid teenager giving you clues <laughs> over a static filled radio. Now, once you have your three digit number, you're going to use the code wheel and enter it. Uh, this is going to give you another number that tells you which answer card to draw. Now, this answer card is going to tell you you're wrong or lead you to do one more lookup. That's pretty simple. But again, I don't want to spoil anything because I don't know if any of the other exit games are different. And that'll get you one final answer card that's going to tell you, yes, you did it or not. If you did it, that's going to then unlock more riddle cards from the riddle deck or tell you you won the game. Right. So I, the the one thing about this game that I find interesting is that you understand from the start how many riddles there are, yes. and that's one of the and that's one of the benefits I find of a real escape room, uh, where I, if you get into the more evolved escape rooms, you are always hoping that that next puzzle is going to be the last. Whereas in this game, the way you've laid it out, you pretty much know how many puzzles yeah. you've got. Yeah, it's very clear, right? In the rule book, it tells you, too. Oh, okay. Like, you also know by the number of clue decks, but it yeah, tells it's, you. Yeah, the, the clue decks games, was that. And I don't know, uh, like this one, the Secret Lab has 10 puzzles. I have no idea if every exit game has 10 puzzles. I have no clue. Um, so once you fit, beat the puzzles, there's a score sheet on the back of the rule book where you fill it out. Uh, this is going to be based on how long you took. So this is where we found out that really the time limit is two hours. Like, to, to get the max score, you could do even better. But, like, if, if you do longer than two hours, it's kind of like a bad score. Uh, you're also going to get scored based on how many of the clue cards you had to use. And to be fair, this is actually more puzzles than some paid escape rooms offer. Ten puzzles is, is a pretty good hunk of, of, yeah. of games to play. So that's the basic premise, like how it works. Now, as for the actual gameplay experience, I guess I started off a bit rough. First off, having never played one of these, we had no idea what we were looking for when getting the first clue. While I can't be certain, now that we know the flow of how an exit game works, I have a feeling that every exit game would now go quicker for us. Just how you know what to put in the clue wheel took a eureka moment for us. And now that's one thing I see pretty regularly about this game is player count. And this is actually my experience in real escape rooms as well. Um, while BGG states two as the best player count, uh, if you look into their numbers, again, if you can always click on that and, and see some of the math behind it and looking elsewhere outside of BGG, I see a lot of recommendations for three to four players. Now, if this is the, this is key, if it's the first time you've done an escape room, having either more people or someone who is experienced with escape rooms in general goes a long way. That if, if you have a, a, a group of eight people who have never mm -hmm. done an escape room in an escape room, it's hilarious to watch them <laughs> flail around having no clue even what sort of thing they're supposed to be looking at. Whereas if you've right. got one person in there who can help guide people in the right direction, everything just flows more smoothly. Yeah, like I said, there, there's one thing that we found we had to look for, and knowing that changed our whole perspective. Right. Like Deanna noted in the chat, she's certain she wasted way too much time staring at the props and not focusing on the riddles. Everything in this is the riddles. Yep. Now, another thing that took us way too long, and it was literally the first step, was identifying something in a picture. Now, you do this a lot, and you probably do it in all the other exit games just based on the format, because I don't know what else you'd be able to do with cards in a booklet. And the problem wasn't that the clue wasn't obvious, it's that it was small. Deanna and I are both in our 40s, and this means our eyesight is not what it used to be. And we spent a lot of time staring at an obvious clue, trying to figure out what number was on it, only because it was so small. Now, this was an ongoing issue playing through the Secret Lab. The text on the cards is small. The images on the cards are even worse. The symbols and the images are small. It's bad enough that once we got home, 
Uh, we ended up having to split up the gaming night on this one. We brought out a magnifying glass. Uh, sadly, uh, we're getting old, and uh, it sucks, but that's the facts. Yeah. And as <laughs> Deanna points it out, that's it. There's the clue. It's right there. What the heck is that? Yeah. Right? Like, that was the point we were stuck at. Yeah. It wasn't a puzzle that we got stuck at. Yeah. Now, getting to the actual riddles, I said there were 10 different riddles. They're all quite clever. Uh, none of them were overly simple, uh, where, like, you just looked at it and got it. Didn't happen. But none were really hard enough to stump us. Uh, we finished our game only using one clue, and we only used that one really reluctantly. I got to admit, there was one puzzle, that, a couple puzzles we got stuck on for a while, but given enough time, we solved them all. We were probably a little more stubborn than we should have been. Like, we probably, at one point, we did use a clue just to confirm we had unlocked everything we needed. And yes, we did. So we were good there. Um, the riddles themselves are a mix of logic puddles, pattern recognition, reading comprehension, deductive reasoning, process of elimination. There was pretty much the gamut there. Um, there was drawing, tracing, and so on. I have to say I was impressed by the variety of different puzzles. And it's definitely good to hear that they didn't sort of dig in and stick to anything too narrow just to hang themselves on that theme, a secret lab. So let's, you know, keep to a certain theme and... and and yeah. move in that direction, uh, you know, to hear the fact that they, you know, spread it out and you had, you know, a variety of 10 different uh, puzzles to work on is, is good to hear. Actually mentioning the theme, they did a really good job of sticking to the theme in ways. Um, like there were, there were chemistry based things in many of the puzzles, but not all. Right. Again, I don't want to give anything away. Now, the other problem we did have, though, uh, was that these puzzles, mostly being on cards and in a book, was the fact it was hard for two of us to work on at once. They had often felt like one of us was doing the work and the other was looking over the other's shoulder. Um, like, again, Board Game Geek recommended this with two, and I think this is the main reason why. Like, I can see this being a bigger problem with more than two players. If we had had a regular group of five, because I had originally bought this to bring out on a Monday night green, I think three of us would have been sitting there waiting for something to do or waiting to be past the puzzle because we wouldn't have been able to do it all at once. Uh, yeah, so this is a big issue with a puzzle box versus an actual escape room. Uh, you can't explore the other aspects and prepare for what might be next or examine other avenues. There's just that one item to be staring at. And I apologize to the people in the chat room who are confused. I fixed it. I'm sorry. Moving on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will admit there were points where we had multiple riddle cards out at once. So there were a couple times when we could each be working on something. But most of the time, though, it was trying to, trying to, to, to figure out one puzzle. Now, we also did run into an actual misprint of a card. Now, that misprint totally confused us, though in the end, it didn't actually have an impact on solving the puzzles. Uh, if anything, it sent us off in the wrong direction for a while. Now, that card was a clue card, and there's a chance you'll never see it if you pick this up. But if you have an early printing of the Secret Lab, it is worth looking up for an errata, which is sad. You never have to do that. Note, this doesn't make the riddle unsolvable, and it doesn't ruin the game, but it's going to confuse the heck out of you. Yeah, there. Uh, this is called out actually boldly on the main board game geek page of the game that the first printing has an error. So they've obviously realized that this is a horrible thing because it's not too often you see errata on the front page, first thing you see almost on a game. Yeah, it's it's bad. <laughs> yeah, like it's uh, it's a translation issue. Yeah, but overall. Deanna and I had fun. Um, we scored six stars out of 10, which I think is pretty good for our first time playing one of these games ever. Um, I was extremely impressed by the ingenuity of game, just the, the way it worked, right? Like the way they managed to use these various decks of cards and how clever the code wheel actually works and how you look up clues without it spoiling anything. Uh, though there's just, there was something missing. I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that it was just a bunch of cards and it wasn't a physical escape room, like Sean said. I've never done a physical escape room, so I can't compare the two. Hope to do one in November. Uh, I just wanted something more. I don't know what. Uh, despite that, though, it was a fun way to kill a couple hours. I think it was a good, fun experience, but wasn't amazing. Like, I had people have kind of raved about these style of games and how they've, they've broken what board games are. There's a whole new experience. I didn't get that big wow factor. So this game actually comes up as a good first choice because one of the others in the series is apparently much better. And people have commented that moving to this game after playing the other one 
is a bit of a letdown. So okay. uh, what I've heard is the exit the game, the abandoned cabin is a notably superior game. Now, I don't know for what reasons. I don't even actually understand. Mm. You know, I don't know why. <laughs> but a lot of people have said that it sort of, I, I, it seems like you get, the, some of the immersion is a little better. Okay. Um, so uh, people are saying, you know, the, because of the, the, you know, the theme of the puzzles and things, there is some immersion in this one. And you can yeah. get yourself sort of, you know, hooked or in that thought space. Uh, but again, ab- apparently exit the game, the abandoned cabin is the better. Okay. I want to talk a bit about the destruction of components and the exit the game series of board games. One of the most controversial aspects of the exit series of games from Cosmos is that they're one and done. Not only can you only play it once because you solved all the puzzles, but the physical copy of the game can only ever be played once by anyone. That's because while playing the game, you end up marking up, damaging and destroying the physical components. Yeah, so a legacy game, but without any legacy except recycling. Now, many blogs out there are going to tell you you don't have to destroy anything to play one of these games. I want to swear here because I I don't agree. I want to call gaming and BS on that. Um, Well, I guess it's technically possible. You could make the game replayable without destroying anything. It's going to require you to basically duplicate the game. You're going to have to make duplicates of a bunch of the components in the game in order to preserve the originals. Like, sure, you could use paper and take notes for certain puzzles. That's fine. But other ones literally require you to cut up or fold components. And unless you're going to exactly duplicate those components somehow, like tracing them, drawing them out, photocopying them or something, you're going to end up making your copy of the game unplayable. And yes, I've seen a couple people out there saying my visual acuity is good enough that I can do it without having to cut and I can just picture it. I sure maybe good on you. That's not going to be the average gamer. Yeah. So, and in duplicating and preparing the game for replay, you'd by necessity spoil it. So you would need a third party to do it for you, which is just getting way out of hand. Yeah. Like like these games are cheap, right? They're, they're 50 bucks us MSRP. You can usually even find them cheaper. 15, not 50. 15. (laughs) Sounded just, just to clarify there. Yeah. One five US MSRP, and they can usually found cheaper. You can find package deals. Uh, I just don't think it's worth the time and effort to make a replayable copy. I personally took the staples out of the booklet because then we could hand out the pages. I, I literally took the book apart. We folded things. We cut things. We traced things. I used pens and paper and pencils. Uh, I used a card as a ruler to do something because it needed a straight edge, which actually ruined the edge of the cards. Like, no one's ever going to play my copy of the Secret Labs again. It's literally in my recycle bin outside. Should be going out, I think, tomorrow. If not tomorrow, a week for tomorrow. Like, if you're going to buy an exit game, just know going in, that it's meant to be written on, folded, cut up, and destroyed. It's all part of the experience. Yeah, so I, as uh, as D just pulled up right now, we've got a link in the chat room. It's under ten dollars on Amazon right now. Is that for the Secret Lab specifically? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was I, I checked when I checked earlier today. It was like nine ninety eight or something like that for for the Secret Lab. Um, you know, it's it's really really cheap. And it's probably worth noting at this point. Like I would have disclosed at the beginning of this that this was a review copy. This isn't. I bought this. I bought this game. So. It, this is not one of those cases where Cosmo sent me a copy of the game. This is, I, I paid for it and tore it up. Of course, yeah, I think everyone everyone knows that I do that with my Gloomhaven too. So <laughs> if I'm willing to do it with a $150 game, I might as well do it with a $15 Jeff game. is saying the price of a 3D cinema ticket. I think it's actually cheaper than that, that I can get a 3D cinema ticket for. But, you know, yeah. again, you're, you're, you're going to get, you know, for however many people you play with, you're getting, you know, an two hour or two, two hours of, of gameplay for 10 bucks, that's pretty good. I mean, you can't get a couple of Starbucks coffees for that. So, yeah, the most expensive thing of this was probably the cappuccino and the coffee we bought on the night we were going to play the game. So, all right. 